this is part two of the lecture. I want to do speech audiometry now. Now remember, we are doing a complete audiometric evaluation. We've already talked about case history. We've already talked about otoscopy. We have found pure tone thresholds. Remember, thresholds are where the softest sound, the softest sound that a person can hear, that proverbial pin drop, that's what a threshold is. We have found pure tone thresholds for air conduction at 250, 500, 1000, 2000, 4000, and 8000 hertz. And we have found pure tone thresholds for bone conduction at 250, 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz. Now, one thing that wasn't very clear in my last lecture, I apologize because it was going so fast. We start at 1000 hertz as opposed to 250 or 8000 hertz because it's right in the middle. It's just an easy tone for people to hear. Believe it or not, people really have a hard time with audiometry. You put the, the, the headphones on to a person and they're in the soundproof booth and people kind of flip out a little bit. They, they, you know, sometimes they don't understand the instructions. Sometimes language is, you know, second languages is an issue. But more, more often than not, people are, they're just a little bit scared or a little bit anxious. It's maybe more of an issue of anxiety. So we start right at 1000 hertz because that's a nice boop. It's right in the middle. It's very easy for people to hear. You start at 250, which is, you know, really a low pitch sort of uh, tone, or start at 8,000 hertz, you know, it's very, very high. It's really hard for people to make much sense of that. Have you ever played on a piano? You play right in the middle, middle C, ding, ding, ding. It's nice and easy to hear, but you play the very lowest note. It doesn't really sound like much. You play the very highest note, and it's really rinky-tinky. It's kind of hard to make sense of, too. Start right in the middle at 1,000. People do better with audiometry in terms of giving you responses. We then move to 2,000, to 4,000, to 8,000 hertz, then go to 250 hertz, 500 hertz, and then we switch ears. And then after we get both left and right air conduction thresholds for the patient, we take the air conduction transducer off and we put the bone oscillator on and we get bone conduction for both right and left ears, okay? So I wasn't very clear in the last video, so I wanted to make sure that I cleared that up. We're gonna talk about speech audiometry now, okay? Sometimes I start first with speech audiometry, and the reason being is, you know, pure tones are like beeps and boops, that sort of thing. We don't hear beeps and boops, right? We hear words, that's what we hear. Whether or not we can sort of tell if we are hearing well or not isn't because of beeps and boops that we hear, it's because of speech. If a person darkens, you know, my doorstep and comes and sees me, it's usually because they're having trouble hearing speech. So we do speech audiometry as a way of testing a person's ability to hear real life things, words, right? Beeps and boops are important to me, but they're not really important to patients. What's important to tell patients is how well they're hearing actual words, okay? So for speech audiometry, we do two tests. One is called speech reception threshold, SRT, and we do one that's called word recognition score, WRS, okay? So SRT, WRS, we do those two tests with every single patient. And as I said, sometimes I start first with that, with some patients, if I, if I think that maybe the pure tones are a little hard for them to understand. What we do with SRT, because it's a speech threshold, speech reception threshold, we are finding the softest level on the audiometer. Remember, I have the computer that I use to present to a patient. The softest level that a patient can hear words, okay? And when we do that, we are using words that are from a closed set. In other words, I am giving the patient a list of 10 words perhaps ahead of time at a nice audible level. A person with normal hearing should be able to hear words at around 50 decibels. So I'll go into the left ear and say, repeat the following words. Say the word cell phone, say the word bathroom, say the word sandwich, say the word building, township, etc., etc. Now, we, I wouldn't use the South African list. I would probably use words from this list. But at any rate, the point, the point being is we use words that are called spondees. Spondees are words that have equal emphasis on the first and second syllable. Words like ice cream, hot 
dog, baseball. Do you hear how there's not really a emphasis on the first syllable and then kind of a swallowing of the second syllable? We want to make sure to use words that are that are sort of low frequency laden. So you have the uh uh sort of thing, almost a very that uh, sort of rhythmic presentation of it. We give them the list of 10 words ahead of time, so therefore it is a closed set. The person knows what the words are, and from there we do the staircase method. Say the word ice cream at 50 decibels. The patient says ice cream. I go down to 40 decibels. Say the word baseball. The patient says baseball. I go down to 30 decibels. Say the word airplane. Now, let's say in this case, the patient is like, I didn't hear it. So I'll go up five decibels. It's the same staircase method that we used for pure tones. Down 10 decibels until the patient doesn't get it, and then up five decibels. And wherever we get like two or three positive responses at the softest level possible, that's the SRT. That's the speech reception threshold. Now, hopefully you can see that the SRT should more or less match up what the pure tone air thresholds are because we are doing SRT through air conduction. We're doing it through the entire auditory system, outer, middle, inner ear. So if we have an SRT at around 50 decibels, meaning that the person can't make out that list of words at 40 decibels, but they can barely do it at 50 decibels, we should have pure tone thresholds for the beeps and boops right at around 50 decibels. It shouldn't be much different than that. Now, it, you know, it may, it may kind of come down, like start off at 20 and then, you know, by the time we get to 8,000 hertz, be at 60 or 70, but those middle frequencies should more or less match up. 1,000 hertz, if it's at 20 decibels, but the person is saying that they can't hear words until 50 decibels, I ain't right, something is off. Person's, person's playing games with you, and ain't nobody got time for that. So in other words, it's speech, speech audiometry is a good way to sort of check your work. People, you know, can kind of fake you out on the beeps and boops and stuff, but for words, people kind of have a harder time faking you out, especially because they sort of can give themselves away. I'll say, say the word baseball, and remember, the person has been given the words ahead of time. So if the person's like looking at me and goes like, um, ball? I, I know that the person is BSing me because the person already knows the list of words. There's no way that they heard just the word ball when they already knew what the word was, baseball, in the first place. So the person, if they were truly guessing, would have said baseball, meaning that the person knows that it had to be one of the words from the list. Um, people, for one reason or another, do like to fake hearing losses a lot, not for the reasons that you would expect that they do. Um, kind of the profile of a person faking a hearing loss is generally an adolescent. It's generally somebody who's just having some trouble in school, maybe not getting along with their parents anymore. Adolescence is a terrible time for all of us, and all of us did kind of probably some questionable things when we were adolescents. So faking a hearing loss is just a, you know, it, it kind of falls under the same psychology as, you know, why people have, you know, go through you know, their gothic phase, or maybe people do cutting, you know, all those sorts of things that, that teenagers do, you know, that basically are kind of um, cries for help or needing some attention. Now, I'm not, you know, judging that at all or anything by saying that. I'm just saying that people tend to think that it's people, you know, faking a work injury or some sort of litigious, like um, a lawsuit or something like workman's comp, or that's why people fake hearing losses. It's not usually it. People don't usually fake hearing losses unless it's um, they're, they're, it's a cry for help or wanting some attention. At any rate, spondees, those are words, as I said, that have equal emphasis on the first and second syllable. Now, in Spanish, which we have a lot of uh, Spanish speakers in the Bronx, we have to use what are called troches, words that are sort of equal emphasis on three syllables. Now, I'll tell you why a little bit later, but Spanish has a relative dearth of one-syllable words, which what we are what we need to use for the word recognition score, which is the next test that we're going to talk about. So we have to use spondees for word recognition score and use troches for speech reception score. In other words, that's just a really long way of saying that we have to use three-syllable words in Spanish. Cuarenta, um, abuela, paseo, bonito, those sorts of words for speech reception threshold, okay? If you wanna think of that as spondee reception threshold, so be it, it's, it's fine with me. Just remember that SRT 
is going to be a threshold. It's going to be a number. It's going to be a DB level, a decibel level, where the person cannot hear words anymore or where they can just barely hear them. Okay, and remember, SRT needs to more or less match up with what the pure tones are. Okay, now the next test that we do for speech audiometry is called word recognition score. Okay, what we do is we take the SRT, the spondy reception threshold, the speech reception threshold, and add about 40 decibels to it. So in the left ear, let's say the person's SRT was 50 decibels, which is, that's a moderate hearing loss. We'll add about 40 decibels. So now I'm talking to the person at 90 decibels in their left ear and then whatever it is in their right ear. Remember, it doesn't have to be the same. People can have good hearing in one ear and poor hearing in another. But suffice it to say, let's do one ear at a time. Person's SRT was 50 here. Now I'm going to test their word recognition score at around 85 or 90 decibels. Why do we do that? Well, we want to bypass the person's hearing loss. We want to give the person a fighting chance of being able to hear words. I am now speaking to the person at an audible level, at a comfortably audible level for them, okay? So I talk to the person and I give them a list of 25 words and now it's an open set. These could be any old word in the English language. They have to be one syllable words, however, and we usually use a carrier phrase with them. So I'll say like, say the word cat, say the word dog, etc., etc. Now, because this is an open set, these are not words that we familiarize with the person ahead of time. So I have to be very careful with how I pronounce them because the person's hearing them for the first time. The other thing about word recognition scores is we want to use a word list that is what is called phonemically balanced, meaning that we want to make sure that there are more or less a representation of the uh, phonemes within the language in question in the list at the frequency that more or less represents what they are in real life. It's not a very good way of describing it. Let's put it this way. We want to make sure that the list doesn't oversample any one phoneme within the language in question. It doesn't do me any good to give them a list of words that have the same phonemes over and over and over again, because then all I've done is test the person's ability to hear that specific phoneme. If I choose a list that's phonemically balanced, I am making sure that all the phonemes within the language in question are represented with the frequency with which they are indeed within the language, okay? I don't think that's a better way of describing it, but let's put it this way. We wanna make sure that all the speech sounds that are within the language that we're testing, in this case, English, are on the list there somewhere and are not overrepresented for phonemes that are not frequent or underrepresented for phonemes that are, that are very frequent, okay? So that kind of leaves us with some weird words on the list sometimes. And uh, I have a little bit of a speech impediment myself, so I have to be careful of how I say them. I also have my Midwestern accent. Um, I, there is a word on the list, say that bathe, B-A-T-H-E, that every single patient of mine here says base just because of how I say it. So I'll say, say the word bathe, and people say base. Well, people say that, you know, enough, and I, it's, it's my error, so I have, I have learned to kind of uh, account for that. At any rate, I say, say the word cat, say the word dog, say the word blah, 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 blah. I give them 4% for each one right, or if it's easier to think of this way, subtract 4% for each word wrong. The reason why we do that is because it's a percentage. It's a word recognition score. So think about this, do the math with me. If we have a 25 word list for the left ear, 25 word list with different words for the right ear, I'm gonna get a percentage for the left ear and a percentage for the right ear, and we'll take it from there. Now, this is a typical word that I, the word list that I use. This is what's called the W22 word list. Say the word, say the word mew, say the word bathe, say the word felt, ache, knees, twins, things, stove, true, and skin. Now, if they get those first 10 right, I give them 100% because those are the hardest 10 words on the list. If they get even one of them wrong, I then go to the next words as she or it jam, etc. Okay? Now, there's 25 words here. If they get one wrong out of those 25, I subtract 4% because 25 times four is 100. So we want to get the best word recognition scores possible. And 
this might be helpful. If the person scores between 88 to 100 percent, they get an excellent score. 72 to 84 is good. 60 to 68 is fair. Below 60 percent is poor. What does this mean? What is that for? In general, and this is very general, the better the person's word recognition score, the better they're going to do with hearing aids and other amplification devices. The poorer a person's word recognition score is, there's too much damage to the inner ear, cranial nerve number eight, or the central auditory pathway. No amount of amplification, no amount of hearing aid rehabilitation is really gonna help them because we're dealing with a damaged cochlea, a damaged organ. Making things louder doesn't make things necessarily clearer for them. That's why the word recognition scores are tested at what are called super threshold levels. I am testing the patient's ability to hear words at levels that I know that they can hear, okay? So a normal hearing person is going to have SRTs at around, you know, 5 dB, 10 dB. To be honest, I don't really go that much in my practice below. If I can establish a person can hear at 10 decibels for SRT, I just take it there. And then I then test word recognition score at 50 decibels. And that's what I'm gonna get for a person with normal hearing. But the poorer and poorer a person's hearing is, remember the farther down those X's and O's are on the graph, the louder I have to make the sounds, the more decibels it takes for the person to hear or understand in the first place, you know, it, it's, it's gonna have to be louder levels that I present these word recognition scores lists at. It is not uncommon for me to present word recognition score lists at audiometric max at 120 decibels. Because think about it, if a person's pure tone thresholds are at around 80 to 90 dB, and I'm getting an SRT at around 90 dB, meaning that the person can just barely hear, hear words like baseball and hot dog at 90 decibels. I add 30 to 40 decibels to that, and where am I at? I'm at 120 to 130 dB. Sometimes I have to test patients at as loud as the audiometer will go, and sometimes they still can't hear those words. So what do we do? Sometimes I can then give the person visual cues. I'll have the person look at me and I'll say like, say the word mu and they can say it. But in general, we cover up our mouths during that test because we wanna make sure that the person isn't responding to our visual cues. Now, sometimes patients from a rehabilitation standpoint, you know, do overly rely on visual cues. And if the person's doing very poorly without them and suddenly I say, say the word mu and they're getting them right, so much the better. I will allow for visual cues. I just need to make sure I put that onto the audiogram. But let's say even with visual cues, you know, even at audiometric max, the patient still isn't getting any of these words. They have a very poor word recognition score. At that point, we may need to be talking about a cochlear implant, okay? So let's talk about some um, other speed. Well, I guess that's, a, that's actually it I want to do for this lecture. I want to keep these shorter because I know that the shorter they are, the more likely you are to watch them and uh, listen to them. So I'm going to go ahead and post this one and uh, I will post one more today and, uh, and we'll be more or less caught up. So as always, 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 email me at pcadamson at yahoo.com with questions. And I thank you all so much for your patience. This has been an awful time for all of us. Um, and I hope you all are getting through this. Thank you.